dedicated to Henry Foreman. In the years of the primal from the dawn of Jurassic to birth, man mastered the mammoth and horse, and man was the lord of the earth. He made him an oil skin from the heart of his holy tree. He compassed the earth therein, and man was the lord of the sea. He controlled the vigor of steam, he harnessed the lightning for hire, he drove the celestial team, and man was the lord of the fire. Deep mouth. Good afternoon, good evening, good wherever, good whomever, good however I may find you. This is Alan Averill. This is episode 44 of Agitators Anonymous. And how do I find you? The road out of purgatory is long and hard, my friends, and I'm not sure exactly where we are upon that road. So off the top, Instagram, Nemthiang underscore promoted if you want to follow my Quite frankly, mundane and silly adventures. Go on ahead. Patreon.com slash Alan Averill if you wish to support the show. Get access to other podcasts and various other bits and pieces. So this will be a sort of a ramble across a few different opinions, observations of where we are right now as we come up on a year in lockdown. Um, I know some people have been wanting me to tell some more silly heavy metal stories and to basically give some light and shade to the podcast. I get it. And no problem. I've got some very interesting and revealing uh, cool heavy metal video cast guests coming up. And over on my YouTube channel, I've started to do a thing called Call from the Grave, I suppose, which echoes my column of the same name in Zero Tolerance magazine, going back over the career retrospectives of some bands and a chance for me to flash a few old vinyls. Um, and this week I posted one about Coroner. So if you're into some heavy metal nerdism, go over and check that one out. Um, so this one, this podcast will be a little bit of a, let's call it um, the sidebar to the last podcast that I made called Do We Have to Agree with the Artists That We Love? Which, you know, generally seemed to go down pretty well. People were interested to hear the opinion about John Schaefer and Iced Earth and how society we should be able to um, separate the actions and deeds of the artists that we love from the artists that we like. But but this week I want to have a little bit of a discussion about, about freedom because I posted something... Well, let me start by saying it's a long time since I argued on the internet. I used to do it as sport. Um, it's incredibly unhealthy. Um, but I used to do it quite a lot, whether it was um, connected to my column that I'm on zero tolerance or my... Um, I suppose what would have been considered outspoken opinions on politics or it just the very nature of 10, 15 years ago, I suppose, 12, 14 years ago, just wading in, um, wading into arguments and debates and picking fights with people. And really the last five to six, maybe seven years, um, I just stopped doing it. I deleted my Twitter, got rid of that. And I would recommend all of you to do that. I mean, it's a tiny percentage of people on there posting 80% of things and our news media cycle um, often delves into that just because the news cycle is so long and predictable and they need new things to discuss. What's Twitter discussing about this, that and the other? The reality is Twitter is a tiny percentage of modern society and you don't need to be beholden to it. So I would recommend deleting it, to be honest. But um, arguing online is a pointless exercise, Um they used to say arguing about music is like dancing about architecture. And I sort of feel the same way about politics or arguing about politics online. It's like flinging shit into a sewer and it's ultimately self-defeating. Um, added to the, it adds the polarization of society and makes enemies of people you you don't know and you, you never will know. Um, and it also contributes to how modern society lacks nuance, lacks understanding. We are judged and defined almost always on the most extreme thing we are supposed to have said and everything is supposed to be taken in absolute face value. Make an observation, comment or joke about something and that must mean that you condone it. So this week I got a bit of a pushback about a quote I posted on Instagram which on the face of it would seem fairly innocuous which is the average man does not want to be free he simply wants to be safe. Now some people balked at it of course because some people balk at everything. But the implication, of course, 
being that no one wants to be considered average, especially not in a modern society that tells them constantly how individual they are. I think the irony of posting um, a quote about being free on a social media platform seemed lost on some people. But I did get some pushback over this. The quote is from a man called H.L. Mencken, who lived from 1880 to 1956, an American polemicist, author and political commentator called the Sage of Baltimore, the Nietzsche of the USA, um, and as famous apparently as George Bernard Shaw was in Europe in the United States. I must admit, I'd never heard of him before. I knew the quote from before, but I never had attributed it to him. But the last year has really brought into sharp focus many of these, I suppose you've seen them, these 25 quotes on freedom. You're easily... Um, digestible, bite-sized little nuggets of freedom you can just cut and paste and post up on your platforms or whatever, um, your particular choice of trap that you've chosen to um, use for your own. Well, you know what I mean. Um, it's ironic. Um, but they've been very handy for people to be able to post on social media and so I just kind of, you know, threw it out there. Um, and... It's quite revealing and unusual. Many times um, over the last few months when I've been, as you've been listening to the podcast, or if you have been, you'll notice that I do often talk about freedom of speech, freedom, liberty, all these kind of things, um, as they are incredibly important to me. And I think they should be incredibly important to everybody, and especially considering the current circumstances. But I'm going to try and get to that. But many, it, how can we say it, um, consolidated an opinion that I had of a certain kind of trope of argument that keeps being thrown at me. Um, so people would leave comments or DM me and they'd say, were we ever free? Like, man, you know, um, you know, of course, I'm being fatuous with my silly voice. Uh, were we ever free, man? And I find it such an empty question. The kind of question someone who has not really thought about not only where society has come from, but where we are now where we are right now. But it's attempting to sound um, sagely. Yes, Mr. Mencken. Um, and it strikes me as the kind of narcissistic, self-flagellating observation that only somebody who has grown up in a free Western society might make without really thinking about the implications. Were we ever free? Well, of course, there are caveats to that throughout history and time from country to country. But if you're listening to me in a leafy, in a leafy, leafy, leafy suburb of Stockholm, then you know what? You have been, for the most part, free. Um, if you grew up behind the Iron Curtain, it no doubt gives you a greater insight into what freedom is. But to make such a casual sort of flippant comment without really thinking about it, I think it not only astounds me, but I think it speaks to where uh, the West is in relation to the situation that we're in. Um, and not really understanding what freedom means or what it has given us in this I suppose, 20 to 30 year post uh, fall of the Berlin Wall, post Cold War, um, let's call it 30 year golden period of the West of generally upward financial mobility and freedom and for this new emergent middle class to uh, take control of society. But I have a feeling, like I said before, the party's over, my friends. I have a feeling that power is being in an, uh, there's an attempt to take that back from um, people that that 30 year golden period is now coming to maybe coming to some form of an end. No, I understand that the nat my natural pessimism um, is what makes me think that. So that's my caveat. But in Ireland, true enough, you can point to parts of our complex history when we were not, no doubt, free. But by and large, you've grown up in the last 34 years, 30 or 40 years, like I said, um, you have. And so the conceit seems astounding to me to imply that somehow in modern Ireland of 12 or even 16 months ago, months ago, that you were not free. It seems like a ridiculous concept. And that especially from people who would lean heavily into notions of Irish freedom and liberty um, seem to be the same people who got annoyed at my poke in the ribs on an Instagram post, but yet quite willingly have handed over, in my opinion, their freedoms to the, to the state over the last year. Um, the irony or the... The incredible um, contradiction there is very self-evident to me. But it seems like um, many people 
seem unperturbed by the situation. Um, in fact, we could say or observe some people even seem to enjoy it because it has ab abdicated them of their responsibility to life, essentially, or to agency or to worry, because now they just have a set of rules that they know where the parameters are that they can just follow. Um, well, enjoy may be a strong word, but it would seem that they relish the idea of not having things to think about or worry about. But it seems somehow like we've been perfectly, to me, uh, played on some level into not understanding the implications of what we've given away. Um, because we're so polarized into our separate groups, we've been, how can we say, fighting on street corners while the main heist is happening in broad daylight. Anecdotally, I used to speak to a group of women in Iran about living there. Um, I suppose a sort of small group of primordial fans. Um, for some reason, you could look at some of our social media platforms and you can see a very detailed account of where you have the most followers. Um, I was just speaking to a band um, I might be dealing with, working with or discussing contracts with them. And once you dig into their Spotify numbers, you can go, oh, unusual. 20% of your listeners are from Turkey, for example. So you can see where as a band you have fans and there is almost no barriers to that information. So, oddly enough, I ended up uh, speaking to a bunch of women in Iran. And if you ever want to know about freedom and sacrifice, these were the people to talk to. And it put a very different perplex uh, complexion on my attitude to all of those things. And um, we talked about music. Um, we talked about culture, about society, about misogyny, about all of those kind of things. And one of day, one of them sent me a video of a stoning um, and if you've ever seen this, um, firstly, I wouldn't advise it, but uh, it will change your views on many, many things forever. And shortly after that, um, before we uh, stopped talking for whatever reason, she asked me why, why were the women in the, at the end of the Berlin, um, at the end of the Women's March in Berlin chanting Alo Akbar? Um, why were they doing that? Didn't they understand how things were there? And Shouldn't I try and tell them? And I suppose in my own way, I did write a column for a magazine about it at the time, which predominantly fell on deaf ears, but I didn't really know what to tell them. All of those things, all of those thoughts have been building up over the last couple of months um, to make me question our relationship to freedom. And I have this feeling that in, in the West, this generation, this current generation that is, I suppose, has been played by a decade of social media, has kind of taken for granted what we've given away. As I said before, democracy right now has been paused and civil liberty suspended. So, again, some people are probably sick of hearing me talk about freedom, about civil liberties. Um, they're tired of hearing me say the same thing. And like I said, don't worry, there'll be some heavy metal chit chat coming up soon enough. And I'm going to change tack a bit. But I did want to do this as a kind of, um, you know, uh, a companion piece to the discussion last week about um, do we need to agree with the artists that we love? Because the implication was also about freedom of speech. And that's a very important part of the makeup of this podcast, this random um, chat that I'm trying to move my way through. So Let's just, for example, take, let's be technical and bureaucratic about things. Um, one of the most worrying things about modern culture is how our right to reply, um, our right to due process has been eroded, um, if not completely dissolved. The idea of a fair hearing or um, being presumed innocent until proven guilty seems to literally have been, you know, flung from the moving car of technological advancement. Um, it doesn't really exist the same way anymore. You're, are you being banned from a platform? Um, who do you ask? Do you get an answer? No. What is the implication for freedom of speech on those terms? The implication is that one of the most defining structures of our um, civilized society is the idea of due process. And so when somebody says to me, oh, were we, were we ever free? I would say, well, traditionally in the past, you had a right to due process. Now, um, it would seem that you don't. So, like I said, to be technical, technical and bureaucratic about these things, um, 
let's apply this to the current situation that we're in or a hypothetical about where the next 6, 9, 12, 15 months might leave us. So let us say within these terms, like I said, um, that you have no one to ask for validation, that you have no right to uh, appeal, right to reply, um, because the human context of all of these um, processes have been removed. So let's say you go to hold that gig, that show, that book launch, that art exhibition, a small theatre group, comedy, open a small business, anything, anything you can think of, the things that are used, you're used to hearing me talk about, connected them, and you don't get your health and safety tick in the online box, you ain't having it. Like I said in the last podcast, the idea that the metal scene can go underground and have gigs in secret places um, while everyone has a phone in their pocket would seem to me to be um, a pipe dream, a sort of utopian ideal that uh, is entirely unrealistic. But here might be the, you know, the, the what it boils down to in a very boring way is that you fill out an online form, an application form for your, like I said, gig, let's say, because this is the this is these are the parameters that I know. This is the world that I inhabit. And you don't get that tick. You don't get that gig. So health and safety without explanation will come first as judged and defined by, it would seem, an unelected board of people regardless um, and as I said flippantly before, doesn't this sound like life behind that iron curtain I mentioned before? No art or expression that is not validated by the state, albeit um, under the rubric of health and safety, right? The implications are dark. I'm not sure I use the word rubric in the right context there, but I quite like it as a word, rubric, rubric. Maybe I will call my firstborn rubric Averill. Has a ring to it, has a ring to it. Anyway, what am I talking about? I'm going mad. It's clear. It's clear. I'm going mad. But hang in there with me. So all this discussion of a 0% strategy to the situation that we're in. Now, I ain't no scientist, um, but I do understand that this is not how these things seem to work. Um, for such a strategy to work, you would need uh, uh, the entire international community to... Um, step in line with this strategy um, and you basically would create a fortress of your country for the foreseeable future and therefore lockdown continues so when I hear those kind of discussions it really fills me with some form of existential dread because um, behind at least how it seems to me behind a zero strategy is the idea that lockdown just rolls interminably um, the, the behind that ideology is inference that this is how we more or less live now, or at least for years to come. Because if you try and up your borders and create a an, an impenetrable fortress, um, why is there no power metal band called Impenetrable Fortress? For years to come. So when you hear talk of, um, and you've heard it, of uh, when you hear talk of keeping distancing rules in society, this is exactly what I feel that they mean. And I've said it many times before. You don't dance with a stranger till you get to zero. We are in level five here in Ireland, the most strict. For you to dance with a stranger, you got to get to zero. Um, that's the new game. No, what I'm trying to, to say is that there are no gigs, no shared laughs in a comedy, no shared laughs in that small comedy cellar, no vegan slam poetry nights, no classical recitals, no filled stadium for sports, whatever. Apply it to yourself. And I'm not just talking about the music industry. I'm talking about the future of art. Now, you may go, oh, Alan, will you stop being so melodramatic? Well, you know what? Maybe in nine months time or 12 months time, at the very least, I will just look like I've gone a bit mad with melodrama. Um, and I'll take that accusation on the chin. That's no problem. But I've said it before and it needs saying again, none of the metrics by which you judge the quality of your life would be the same under these conditions before we even get into our right to travel, to move, to see the world. And let's be clear, and these are not things I often use um, within arguments because they tend to be um, alien to me, alien to me. Well, maybe, maybe not. But let's be clear, to fall in love, um, to date, to have those one night stands that you laugh over with a friend the next day at a hungover noon coffee and a brunch. No dates, no cinema, 
all of those things, pretty much nothing but the small bubble of the immediate people you knew from before. Oh, Alan, will you stop being so depressing? I can't take it anymore. Well, like I said, don't worry. I, I promise some heavy metal flippancy and some dumb tour stories the next time round. But I would ask, is this how we want to live? Is this freedom? The idea that this remote living, remote working future um, just has you coupled up with the same small bubble of people for the next couple of years. Who knows? Then you just slowly become demoralized, Stalinized into this method of living and it just becomes accepted. Is this is this really what the people discussing 0% and keeping all of these rules in place really wish for people in life or have they also not thought about it particularly? Um, because this is the this is the crunch, I suppose. This is the argument behind it. If they have thought about that and the implications for society, that means that um, I think that they have some very structured idea of how the future is going to pan out. If they're, you know, running scared and making things up on the fly, like I said before, a botched response by a broken system, which is only human, then OK, I can understand at the spur of the moment saying, oh, we need to keep some of these things in place. But if it's meant very seriously, then this is an attempt to turn to turn society and human agency on its head of us being social human monkeys into living in very small cages, so to speak, morally, mentally, emotionally, um, physically, sexually, all of these things. Um, and it really worries me. And if it doesn't worry you, I'm not sure. I think you should be worried. Maybe it's a vast overreach. Maybe all of this, as I said before, is the biggest overreach ever in the history of mankind. Um, now, that's quite the statement, isn't it? Maybe I need to unpack that. Maybe it is a vast overreach. And if you overreach for 100% of your demands, you might get 10% or 15%. And you might go, oh, great, we got 10%. We got 10% of, of our Orwellian dystopian future that we were hoping for. And that's enough. Because permanent disting, permanent distancing, in my opinion, is the is the you know the the glove that fits over the fist of permanent lockdown, um, and how we how we accept risk. Three hundred and fifty to four hundred people apparently die each day from cancer in the UK. How do we appropriate risk and appropriate death into a society that moves ahead? If we set out our stall for dealing with everything like this, but I would also say to people. Look back through history. Um, how are we or who are we now to believe that the small, powerful minority of people who, let's be honest, run or rule this world or make decisions for this world, um, who will send young men and women to die in conflicts in far-flung lands over freedom without a moment's notice throughout history? Um, they happily press the button and send your sons and daughters or whoever else, out to war, that now they care so much about every life that they would like to keep you safe by appropriating and taking from your own decision-making process every risk so that you must live life remotely for your own safety. Do you really believe that? Do we as a society really believe that as rational people who have known um, an open, relatively open free society? Now, for those, of, for those who may be listening to me in countries where um, they know their society is not like that, I'm sure they're screaming at the screen going, oh, I told you so, we told you so. You should be, um, you should be alarmed. You should be viewing these things under these, under these terms. Of course, I, it could all be, as I said, the, uh, the madness of Averill, the incredible melodra melodramatic over the top nature of my pessimism it could also be that i'm just a singer in a heavy metal band right but like i said to believe that these institutions of state power and influence suddenly care so much about every single life when all you have to do is look back through the last ah let's take 50 years and see how there was always a callous disregard for it how do we reconcile those two things with each other? Like I said, politics is rock and roll for ugly people. Well, they are 
Now our rock stars, entertainers and jailers all rolled into one. So what can I say? A botched response by a broken system. We have to hope on some level it is. Anyway, what am I talking about? Alan, stop talking about freedom of speech and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But freedom of speech, freedom, the freedom to express yourself. Because what I'm implying by this is, like I said, is that if health and safety is the most important thing we, as we move ahead in a modern society, everything will come secondary to that. So therefore, the idea that you will just send your mate a text and go, hey, blah, 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 I don't know. The chameleons are playing around the corner. The chameleons, what a great band. And by the way, the band where I stole the world, the words where greater men have fallen from the fan and the bellows if you are interested in checking them out. Anyway, hey, the chameleons are playing around the corner and there's 150 packed into a you know, small little venue. That doesn't happen under these terms because that venue will probably have to go through strict health and safety regimes, have new ventilation systems, maybe so many financial implications that it doesn't open up. Do you need, a, do you need to have um, the vaccine to go in, to go out? How do you scan it? Um, my mind boggles with the potentialities. Not to mention, to be really boring about it, but the issue of insurance. Insurance companies are going to be stretched through the ringer for the last year or two. Are they going to insure a venue that doesn't meet all of these specifications? I don't think so. And I think that's something that we maybe need to think about. But I'm going to do a special YouTube video about where the music industry and where musicians are at soon. But insurance companies, that's something that's going to change. And also, my mind is very, very aware of the potentialities for that system to be abused when it comes to terms of civil liberty and freedom. Because those impromptu moments that defined your life, uh, they don't happen. As I said to a friend, uh, when I was trying to recalibrate this argument, I said, what music did you listen to today? Let's say XXX band. I don't know who it was that she said. And I said, you, let's be clear, under the terms of lockdown, that band don't meet. They don't write that song. They don't make that album that defined your teenage years. Do you understand yet? There's no rehearsal rooms left in Dublin City. Is there rehearsal rooms left in your city? Um, how do people meet? How do bands meet? Or is it just an endless slew of solo artists playing in their bedrooms trying to make computer game music? I don't know. That's not really a society, a musical society that I wish to inherit. Anyway... And on those terms, you won't be able to plan anything because as we, you know, in Ireland, within the Anglosphere, we, I think, in my opinion, naively look to New Zealand and Australia. Of course, like New Zealand, as an example, a country at the end of the world, Australia, a country where all of Europe probably geographically fits into the landmass and Ireland here because we're in the Anglosphere and because, you know, people went on their gap years to holiday in Australia and blah, blah, blah. We have emotional, I suppose, connections with that country. But yet it's not a practical example. Ireland and Ireland's politics should be using Denmark, Finland, whoever else as an example of how to approach these things. Not New Zealand. Doesn't make any sense. But we can witness in those countries, in, uh, they, in Auckland and Perth, they shut down the whole cities over one, two, three cases. So is that the kind of, uh, to me, that's a dystopian reality. And that, does that mean that um, you are always living under the possibility that at any moment you might be locked down. Which, anecdotally from friends living um, in certain countries, um, that's how it may be, that you wake up in the morning and your phone is red or your phone is green. Come on, Alan, that's a dystopian nightmare of a situation. Surely that can't be the reality. Well, like I said before, we have instances now of Irish phone companies handing over GPS records to the state. All the technology is there. Why not? Why not? It strikes me at this moment that I should do an ad read or two um, as I've been rambling, rambling, rambling. Um, HateCouture616.com H-A-T-C No, that's wrong. H-A-T-E-C-O-U-T-U-R-E 616.com Hateful yet tasteful clothing apparel. All sorts of really nasty t-shirts, serial killers, um, some pretty dark humor in evidence. Go there and put in the promo code AA podcast um, and you will get, actually it's not, it's promo code Alan. It's pretty simple. And you will get free shipping. 
cool stuff. Uh, www.metalblade.com. If you're in North America, then you put in the promo code AA podcast and you can get 10% off. Yeah. And I might as well do the last one Lamentations of the Flame Princess www.lotfp.com, um, which is an RPG role playing company uh, who make really high quality, amazing books. Um, if that's your thing, if you're into the whole Dungeons and Dragons type thing, um, which apparently more of you are than would care to admit your secret gamers. Well, go over there and if you buy three books, you get two books of the company's choice thrown in for free. Just use the promo code AAAA, which is very soon where I might end up the AA and the other AA if things keep on going. Um, so I promised that I would not just whinge and whine about our impending Orwellian dystopian future. And I also promised myself I'd stop making that silly voice. But uh, for the next part of the podcast, I wanted to um, discuss the new Adam Curtis documentary entitled Can't Get You Out of My Head. Um, all parts are now on YouTube. I don't know if you know who Adam Curtis is, but I would say... Um, his work has been maybe the most influential when it comes to documentary making over the last 20, 25, even 30 years. You can find, you can go on YouTube and find um, his channel and find 30 years worth of documentary making. The this four part series, Century of the Self, I, th I think is one of the most influential and amazing uh, documentary series that has ever been made. Again, he always finds the kind of slightly left of field backstory, the side narrative to um, the development of the development of human society. So the century of the self takes us through the birth of marketing with Edward Bernays to psychotherapy, psychoanalysis, the Cold War, our attempt to understand the human mind. And this new um, series, Can't Get You Out of My Head, is again a fascinating look at where modern society is, why we are in the place that we are. But what he does, again, is picks four seemingly um, unconnected figures, four or five seemingly unconnected figures throughout the last 40 or 50 years and tells these parallel stories of power and influence um, about colonialism, about empiricism, about revolution um, that are absolutely and utterly fascinating. But one of the most interesting, I suppose, tropes that comes through in the documentary series is uh, the idea of working class revolution or the idea that the working class people across the West almost betrayed um, white liberals or middle class liberals or intellectual, the intellectual liberal class by not revolting, by there never being a revolution. Um, and... I think this has this has a great, very great echoes in the kind of modern identity politics um, that are on display in society because there's been a, a very great feels like an intellectual academic pivot to leave the working class behind. If you look at say New Labour or you know the the, the Corbyn Easter Labour Party of the UK, it seemed to move from its northern working class roots to uh, middle class southern intelligentsia, we could say, and this is really sort of cleverly defined and can't get you out of my head where he discusses um, you know Maoism and the terrifying Red Army purges connected to um, you know the early Black Panther movement which is deeply fascinating as a movement the German revolutionaries um, I suppose who would have turned into the Bader Mannhof gang all amazingly interwoven stories that all seem to come from out of left field with incredible um, stock footage of the time and the music the music is so perfectly chosen and executed um, I can't say enough good things about this new Adam Curtis series but one of the most pivotal moments in it is it shows um, the a 1976 hijacking of a plane by German uh, I suppose socialist uh, left-wing revolutionaries they hijack this plane um, and make it land in uh, Uganda and uh, they help these Palestinian revolutionaries take control of the plane but once they land in the airport they separate they separate um, 
the Jewish passengers from everyone else. And there's a really fascinating interview with one of these left-wing revolutionaries um, who are in prison subsequently. But these prison radicals who watched as their um, their comrades behaved more or less exactly like the people that they sought to oppose, i.e. as fascists or anti-Semites. And it just brings up so many questions about modern society, I think. Um, so I would I definitely recommend checking the checking it out it's called can't get you out of my head just put it into youtube um, i'm not quite finished it yet but two episodes in it's absolutely fascinating but it begs the question do we turn into those that we oppose if we exist uh, on the polar opposites of society i suppose what you could consider it to be is like is society like a horseshoe where the furthest reaches, once you bend that horseshoe round, they eventually converge on the far side because they essentially become like each other. They want the same thing. They want control and domination and power. That's the, um, that's the question that's been rolling around in my head since I've been watching it. Maybe um, some of you might want to watch it and leave some comments for me about it. But I suppose... The whole series so far has um, provoked many thoughts about the situation that we find ourselves in because the implications throughout the series, the resonance is that for a small minority of people who seem to be agitated at the, at whether it is the injustices of society or um, how we relate to freedom or liberty or democracy, this returns back to my initial post, I suppose, on some level on Instagram, in that when I said, you know, uh, the average man does not want freedom, he simply wants to be safe. It seems somehow the resonance of the Can't Get You Out of My Head documentary that's provoked a lot of these thoughts within me has been that it is generally a small percentage of people who who do agitate for these things sometimes. And unless they can galvanize and move um, public opinion or the bulk of people um, into these thoughts, it seems almost impossible. But you do see terrifying visions um, in Maoist China um, of the, like I said, the red, the these young red army radicals who've basically been sent out to destroy all elements of the old order, all elements of old Chinese society in a, a murderous rage. But anyway... I can recommend it. Seek it out. But there is one thing for sure that watching back through the um, great wealth of Adam Curtis documentaries is it will change, I think, how you view, as I've stated many times before in the podcast, the institutions of power and influence um, and how they view society. Um, as I said, the century of the self is perhaps one of the most essential documentary series about defining the 20th century. And what I love about Curtis's documentary making is that politically, it's never always clear where he comes from. In fact, he just allows the off kilter sidebar stories to tell themselves and then slowly come to the surface. But they're very short on judgment or on political polemics or I suppose, in simple terms, picking a side. He very rarely ever does that. In fact, I don't think he really ever does that. He just lets the stories speak for themselves. But certainly, if you go back to the start of Century the Self, to Happiness Machines, it's clear that there's always been, um, I suppose, in a post-industrial revolution world, an attempt to understand, um, manipulate and move the masses in one or other particular direction. And once you've started to watch those documentaries and get into them, it will change, I think, well, it changed my opinion, at least, of how those structures work or how to view those structures. And it's been said to me many times over the last year, um, especially when I've been railing against some of the, um, what I saw as uh, implications of, on civil liberty and all the things that I've been talking about in the podcast. But it's been... It's been very clear that some people have what I would call a blind spot, but I suppose we could call it a blind faith spot, maybe is a better way of describing it. But they have belief, they have an innate belief in the institutions that is linked to a form of um, emotional patriotism, 
that is almost impossible to shake. Regardless of how often you may point to the past, you may say, well, look what the church and state did to Irish people over the last 100 years. Um, it's dark. It's a dark century. And they did many diabolical and terrible things to people. And you can point that out and say, well, we, you know, ostensibly, this is still, um, you know, the drapes may be different. There may be a different coat of paint on the walls and you may have installed some new this, that and the other. But it's the house is still essentially the same one that was built over the last couple of hundred years. And the ghosts of those actions still haunt it. Wow, that's a that's a good metaphor, isn't it? Someone else can have that for a lyric if they want. The ghosts of the charnel house. What I'm trying to say is that people will overlook that for what they perceive as a, 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 as buying into a greater good, such as we got to get through this to get out the other side, whether it's in these terms, lockdown, the situation that we're in. There is an innate belief, though, or, well, maybe belief is not the right word, but an innate ideal that I find very difficult to relate to or to shake in people um, that has them belief that these structures and institutions have their best interest at heart, even when you point out to them, at least to me, instances of when that certainly was not true. And so what exactly is that? What could we consider it? In modern terms, we could say it's brand loyalty. It's why do we believe in um, a certain company because we've been um, inculcated with advertising from a young age or why do we believe in the system the monetary system because it's we have a shared narrative that this is worth this and you also recognize the same thing or else the whole system would fall apart but when you step outside that which is perfectly encapsulated with the situation that we're in now you begin to realize that those same forces are being used in order to hold people in place um did Mr. McQuaid have Irish people's best interests at heart in the 1950s? I'm not so sure he did. And why do we believe that? Why do we believe in the altruism and empathy that we seem to want to find in these institutions when clearly there seems to be little? I don't know. This is something I've been grappling with for the past year because I feel very divorced from that state. I feel like I never had that blind faith in those institutions or the um, the ability to lock off or to close down that critical uh, part of my thinking or my which analysed all of these acts in the past or the machinations of society or the institutions that drive these what I would consider to be undemocratic or illiberal um, authoritarian moves. So... I think it speaks very interestingly to, interestingly, I think it speaks very clearly to the idea that people will buy in to something if they become emotionally engaged in it. There's this, these quotes you can read about um, the Soviet Union, whereby under Stalin they would say, give, if you give the populace two months of sorrow and heartache and fear and outrage, um, there's very little evidence after that that you can give them to the contrary that will shake that fear. And it feels somehow that, that an element of that is what has happened in our society. And that is why we why I return to the to the to the quote at the top of the podcast. The average man doesn't want to be free, etc. Yada yada yada. You've heard me say it a few times. Is because I think we've been so inculcated with this fear, and it's 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 the fear of a silent enemy, which is almost perfect in its in a way. If you were to believe in the authoritarian impulses of those structures, because it's it's silent. It's you cannot see it. And it, it does appeal to our sense of fear, our sense of demoralization. What am I talking about? What am I talking about? I'm talking about our relationship to freedom, our relationship to um, what we view as quality of life and what we're willing to sacrifice in order for what is being sold to us as the greater good, i.e. health and safety. And I think those questions are going to become more and more to the fore over the coming months. 
uh, I like the way it sounds and I think it encapsulates the moment that we're in, the anti-humanism. So when are those those two strains going to become divergent in the main body politic or the main populace? That's the question, my friends. Anyway, anyway. It's been a ramble about freedom. You've probably heard me say some of these things before. Hey, look, it's episode 44. Next week, I am going to have a video cast chat with my good friend, Nicholas Barker, uh, drummer of Cradle of Filth, Jimu Borgir, many, many others, Lock Up, Brujeria. Over the years, that's going to be a big, long video cast with Nick about um, his life, that kind of thing. So please go over to my YouTube channel, uh, take a look at what's there and subscribe. There's going to be more videos. There's going to be more stories about rock and roll silliness. Um, a few more lighthearted um, podcasts. But I just thought this one was interesting because I've been, I've been provoked, I suppose, by the Adam Curtis documentary to think about a lot of these things and these implications. And it seemed to be the right thing to do to have, like, I suppose, the next chapter of the discussion we had in the previous podcast about having to agree with the artists that we like, that this time I should take a look at freedom of expression, freedom of whatever else. All right, my friends, that is it. The end of episode 44. Until next time, metal never bends. <laughs>